So we're heading deeper and deeper into the Phoenix Gate, and we're running into more and more of these weird-ass robotic monsters without really much of an understanding as to what the hell it is we're dealing with. I can take a few guesses, and I did in the last episode, but, you know, I don't really know. Seems the feeling's mutual. I've never made these videos with the intention of them being some kind of a guide to help somebody do a walkthrough or anything like that. I'm not really that great at playing these games, or any games, and it's especially the case that I've never, this is my first playthrough of this, so I don't really have any insight to offer somebody as far as a guide for strategy or anything like that, which is why I don't really have much of a problem with going in fast-forwarding through some of the longer fights, because it's not really what we're supposed to be here for. If you want to learn how to play this game better, I'd recommend watching somebody else. Lots of mini-bosses and stuff, though. This thing is big monster. It is something, though, that I have to say that this game does pretty well. It, it gives a lot of these bosses and mini-bosses unique um, a unique feel about them and unique gameplay mechanics and how you defeat them, but all within the same kind of framework, framework that makes the combat system is so good. It doesn't, like, change things up so much that each boss battle feels like you're playing a different game. It's done. What are these creatures? And why do they keep attacking us? They're probably asking themselves the same thing. We're the ones trespassing here. They're just protecting their home. Jill, look. Is that some kind of view? It's worth a closer look, whatever it is. I think maybe they're asking a different question, or uh, the wrong question there. Why are these things attacking us? And it's like, oh, why they're, they're probably asking the same thing about us. I think they... These people don't really have an understanding of what, like, machinery would be. They're seeing these creations and thinking that they have a, a mind of some sort, even um, an animal mind. I think they're just automations, and they are reacting in the way that they're programmed to, which is to defend the space. So Clive is right, like, yeah, they're just defending their, their place, their territory. That is true, but they're not really thinking that. They just are because that's what they do. Wow, this place is huge. <laughs> is this where, um, where Joshua went after he changed into Phoenix flying around under, underground? It's got to be it, right? Right then. 
This thing, on the other hand, this is different. This doesn't come across like it's some kind of machine. It's not. doesn't look like it has a rigid body. It's not made out of stone or metal. It seems to almost be biological, but it's got this weird glowiness to it. So perhaps, what's that called, a lich? It's the spirit of something that, maybe the spirit of the ancient civilization that had created all this kind of stuff, a, a person from there, or perhaps it's just sort of the, you know, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm speculating at my ass right now. <laughs> Probably right, though. <laughs> <laughs> Not too difficult either. What the hell was that thing? It wasn't like the others. It would seem this place holds even more secrets than we thought. Seems as though even Clive believed that thing was out of place. What the hell was that thing? <laughs> it's different. And we have more monsters to fight. A lot of little battles are putting us through. Jill doesn't really seem to be doing a hell of a lot to help us. For as powerful as she's supposed to be, she just spends a lot of time standing there. The sort of uh, NPC companion, companion curse they see in a lot of games. I'd say the first time I'd ever witnessed that kind of thing was in Secret of Mana, which is another Square game. Uh, by the SNES, like in 1993 or 4 or something like that. Where you had these NPC companions that would roam around, follow you, and help you fight. But they had a tendency to stand around and not do a whole hell of a lot. And I figured at the time it was probably because the processor on the SNES is pretty garbage. And they just didn't have uh, enough processing power left over to power the AI for these things. But I guess maybe it might also be a bit of a game balance thing. Because if they were too good at their job, yeah, the game would be too easy. <laughs> if Jill were helping too much, the game would be too easy. So, it isn't a dead end after all. Apparently not. to lead to this room and look what's in it how old do you suppose this is a thousand years more I don't know I've never seen anything like it before who is that in the middle do you think some sort of God Second dominant to fire. Who are you? What? 
stop it! Please! Stop! Joshua chose me to be his shield. He gave me his blessing and asked me to keep him safe. I should have protected him that day. It was my duty. Joshua died. I killed him. And I blamed another for what I did. To spare myself the guilt. I feared the Bai. Accepting it, I would lose what little was left of me. So I ran. From everything. And now? Are you ready to accept the truth? I am. I know it won't be easy, but it's what I must do. So that Joshua's soul can finally rest in peace. Of course, nothing new was actually revealed to Clive here. He was well aware by this point in the story that he and Ifrit were the same. But I guess it's one thing to know something intellectually and it's another thing to kind of accept it for what it is. So this is, I guess, him accepting that he was this thing, not just knowing it, but truly accepting what it was and trying to sit there and blame the icon like it's something other than himself. Now, I'm not quite sure how true that kind of statement is. If Is the icon, is the dominant truly the same entity, or are they two separate entities that sort of inhabit the same body? I don't know. It seems as though they might be different, because the icon tends not to be something that's always under control of the dominant. But, you know, maybe they are. So here we are with Clive having to fight the Infernal Icon as a way of sort of challenging his inner demon and seeing if he can defeat it and control it, if he can make it a part of himself as opposed to sort of being controlled by it. And that's a depressing thing because he's seeing his... Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if we're seeing some sort of 
like there's some sort of weird time warp kind of thing going because back during the demo when in the beginning of the game you had the scene at the very end where Ifrit is just savaging Phoenix on the ground and tearing into pieces and you hear Clive shouting like, oh. and I think we just witnessed the same thing but just from the external perspective so it's like he heard himself speaking and then we just again witnessed him observing the situation speaking the same like many of the not completely the same I figure but um, a lot of the same lines so is it like there's some sort of like a temporal thing going on where he's like actually back in time right now fighting this or is this all just inside of his head or some sort of like uh, visual representation dreamt up by the by the phoenix gate I don't know now we did see the paintings on the ground and he asked like is this some kind of a god like maybe it is it's also possible that what you're looking at is like a representation of a free drawn there so is the phoenix gate some kind of i, I don't know there's got to be a backstory like perhaps some sort of a conflict between the phoenix by, by between phoenix and the free and maybe that's what the story that the murals were trying to tell but i gotta get deeper into the game to, to know all that shit <laughs> You have a lot of big attacks, you gotta dodge, and then he goes and he throws down that fire ring, and you gotta just gotta get out of the way. This game is jammed full of spectacle. I mean, these fights against the icons, we had to fight Garuda earlier, and now we're fighting Ifrit now, and just gigantic thing, just ripping the scenery apart. It's, this game really goes all out when it comes to spectacle. Something that... I guess something that they tried to do with Final Fantasy XIII, have the, the big enemies and the characters just sort of leaping all around, but the fact that you didn't have control over the characters so much in that game kind of cheapens it and makes it so you're not really watching the character animations at all, you're just sort of watching the stats, you know, the HP, the ATV gauge, all that kind of stuff as charges instead of actually watching the fights. And this, since it's real-time combat that you're controlling, you're, um, you actually gotta watch what's going on. he defeated Ifrit and that was in a way of him accepting the responsibility of what he did but I, I guess in a way it still wasn't because he's still seeing Ifrit there and he's still blaming Ifrit for what happened instead of blaming himself so perhaps this is a sort of a representation of him recognizing the actual fault that he has the the fact that it was him that did what happened back at the Phoenix Gate 13 years ago. And him having to fight this shadow version of himself is the... is actually him accepting responsibility as opposed to blaming the icon. Then again, like, as I said a minute ago, I, I don't know for sure if he is actually to blame at all, whether the icon itself is... He and the Icon are actually one and the same, or if they just inhabit the same body. It's maybe the case, maybe not, maybe not. Clive might just be a victim in all of this. But, you know, I, I don't think. Hit him while he's down! <laughs> There's no sense in winning a fair fight, right? <laughs> that stagger is going on for quite a while. See, you 
so I'll speed this fight up. We're seeing something like um, Clive, or this shadow version of Clive, doing something like what we had seen Sid and Benedicta do, where they sort of half transform into their icon form, as opposed to like full transform, they just sort of gain some of the physical properties. I guess we saw Joshua do it a little bit before he transformed completely in the Phoenix. But this is the shadow figure doing it, not Clive himself. And once we get through this battle, we'll see Clive himself perform a similar transformation and we'll move on to the next phase of this boss battle. But this one does go on for quite a while. I guess it's not too difficult, so it's not that frustrating, but it does take a while. After a certain point, you get kind of a, like, okay, yeah, we, we get it. Let's, uh, let's move on. <laughs> But I guess we're... I'm not quite sure what the symbolism of this is really supposed to be. But yeah, it's the next... It's just the next stage in the fight. Maybe to say that Clive's own strength is quite from you. Maybe this is in, this is supposed to represent Clive kind of coming and understanding that he can't just accept the fact that he and Ifrit are the same. He has to embrace it. If he wants to use the power, he's going to need to use the power, but he needs to not just accept it, but make it a part of himself. And that's what we're doing here. And this sort of half transformation is just him... Um, using that power, taking that power into himself and utilizing it the way he needs to in order to fight on. So many effects and stuff going on at the same time, it's hard to see what's happening. <laughs> Cooldown management is the name of the game. There's numbers everywhere. It is kind of hard to see what's happening. <laughs> So we had played as Ifrit when uh, fighting Garuda before, but this is quite a thing. It's Ifrit fighting itself. <laughs> and we're in another very cinematic boss battle where these two are wailing it out like freaking Godzilla and King Kong. The <laughs> I guess this is like the, the ultimate realization of what I was saying before of Clive accepting what he is. 